have just begun a new series. Pastor Peter started us out last week, but we are talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And um, each each week, actually it's going to take two months to get through the fruits of the Spirit. So each week we will have a pastor speak on a new fruit. And this is the verse that we are taking, this is the scripture that we are using in Galatians 5, to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And the funny thing is about this is when, when you're speaking, when you, when you have a sermon that's coming up, God has a special way of ensuring that you are walking through that thing which you are speaking about that Sunday. He just has a special way of bringing situations into your life that week to help you fully walk out what you are talking about. And so as the pastors, each of the pastors are going to have a a chance to speak on one of these fruits. And so you you sort of check the calendar and see what fruit you've got. And it was like a pastoral Russian roulette. Please, not long suffering, please. (laughs) Self-control. So each week it was like, oh, Jesus, help me. Well, today we are talking about joy. And it seems like joy would be something that's super fun to, to talk about. But this has been a doozy of a week. This, is, this has been a very, very difficult week. But one of the things that God has, has shown me, that he's allowed me to see in this week in particular, is that I have become laser focused on the difference between happiness and joy. And in our vernacular, in our English language, we often use the words happiness and joy pretty interchangeably, right? But actually, they're two totally different things. So before we get started, I wanted to make sure that we are clear on the definition of happiness and joy. Happiness is an emotion, and it's based on external circumstances and outcomes. So it's an emotion. What do emotions do? They can do this. Joy is gratitude rooted in grace regardless of the circumstance. So, um, So happiness, you know, listen, I am not down on happiness. I love happiness. I love to be happy. It's a good thing, but we have to be very very clear about what happiness is. It's an emotion. It's going to come and it's going to go just as quickly as it came. But joy is something that is internally based. It's rooted in grace. It stays within us. Um, So when we're talking about happiness, I have just a, a quick example when our children were younger, there was one year we decided to get Disney passes, specifically to Epcot. So we just decided we want to invest in our family in this way this year. Our kids are, are young enough to enjoy it, but old enough to, that this will still be a pleasant experience. So we went ahead and we, we invested and we, we got Epcot tickets. And so our first, this was our maiden voyage to Epcot. So the kids are hyped. They're excited. We're excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. So we are going over, as you do, you know, you're kind of going over in the car right there. What are we going to see and what are we going to do? So let's decide which, because there's not always enough time to to do everything and see everything. So for this trip, let's decide, you know, which princesses is Rowan going to see and, you know, which rides is Kale going to ride. So we've got our plan. So we get to Epcot. First first time we're using these passes. And Kale and Peter decide, well, Kale's decided he wants to do a ride called Mission Space. So Peter's like, okay, I'll go with him to Mission Space. And you and Rowan plan out what we're going to do after we, we, so Rowan and I are are planning out what are we going to do next when dad and Kale get get done with Mission Space. So we've got it all planned out. So here comes Kale and Peter, after the ride, we meet up. Peter's like, we're going home. We're going home. We can't stay. And Rowan and I are like, pardon? What? Apparently, on Mission Space, there are two options for the ride. 
There is your just sort of normal, nice Epcot ride experience, and then there's the intense, we will spin you till you throw up experience. And he was unaware that there were two different, either he was unaware there were two different experiences or he was unaware of what line he was in. But that explains why he was so baffled by the sick bags that were on the seats. It's like, why why are there barf bags here? That doesn't make any sense. Well, happiness, when you're in the happiest place on earth, (laughs) happiness is not leaving the minute you get there. So all of our plans were instantly changed because he was just so, so sick. And I, I mean, I think we left. I don't know if you rallied or not. I can't actually remember. But that's happiness. We were on this high emotionally. And all of a sudden, I mean, we're saying within three seconds, it changed to tears. That's emotion. That's, that's happiness. It changes quickly. Joy, on the other hand, is a spiritual fruit, And spiritual fruit, much like physical fruit, it has to be cultivated. Um, Many of you know that Pastor Mark, my father, he enjoys gardening and he enjoys farming. And when he goes to plant his garden, he doesn't just throw seeds in the ground and kick the dirt over and go, okay, garden is planted, we are good, get ready to eat well. No, 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 once those seeds are planted, in many ways, his job has just begun because he has to care for those seeds. He has to make sure that they're well watered, that they're fed, that the bugs and the critters stay off of them. There's a lot of work that goes into cultivating those seeds so that we have good fruits and vegetables to eat. And in much the same way, joy has to be cultivated in our lives. The Holy Spirit has put the seed of that fruit within us, but it is our job to make sure that it is well-fed, that it is watered, that the soil is a fertile place for good fruit to, to grow. And so there are three ways that we're gonna look at today at how we can cultivate the joy within our life because it does take some effort on our part. And the first way to cultivate joy within our life is through gratitude. It is gonna be impossible for you to enjoy your life without gratitude. It's not gonna happen. And I mean pretty constant gratitude. Here in Proverbs 23, seven, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. If we're gonna mentally dwell on our problems and our negativity, that is gonna adversely affect the release of joy in our life. We keep dwelling mentally on our problems and on everything that's going wrong in our life. That will work against the cultivation of joy in our lives. It is hope that releases joy. It's speaking out words of life. It's speaking God's promises. That is what releases joy. And when I pray, I always have to start with gratitude. And the reason I have to start with gratitude is because it's really easy to get caught up in our headspace and caught up in our emotions and caught up in how we're feeling at the moment. And when we start speaking out our gratitude to God, it helps our perspective change. It's a change in our, in, in our mental state. It's a change even in our emotion. It helps us see things differently. And let me tell you, I have had a doozy of a week. I have had nights where I couldn't sleep, so I just had to go outside. And you, you know those, those nights where it's like, you've just got so much going on in your head, you don't even know what to pray. It's like the words aren't even there. You, in some ways, you just feel like a zombie. So I had to just start speaking out my gratitude to God in whatever I just saw, because I couldn't even think. I couldn't even think straight. So I walk outside, I'm like, God, I thank you for that tree. I thank you for the moon. I thank you for this pavement that I'm walking. I mean, it just sounds ridiculous, but I had, that was all I had. That was all I had in that moment. And we are gonna go through days where that is all we have, and we have to speak it out. We have to start speaking out our gratitude. In the morning, you're going, boy, if you're not a morning person, it's, it, mornings are rough. You know, it's like that, that feeling of dread where it's like, it's all starting over again. And I, you know, I, 
I'm becoming more of a morning person the older I get, but it's still, mornings are rough, you know? So I, there are mornings this week that I was like, God, I thank you for that coffee that I'm getting ready to get up and make. And I thank you for the air conditioning in my house and I'm gonna sit here in this air conditioning and drink my coffee. And I thank you for that garbage man that's picking up my garbage so that I don't have to figure out what to do with all of that mess, right? So we have to just start speaking out our gratitude as our feet hit the floor in the morning. And this takes some effort. And I'll tell you why it takes effort. It's because the devil does not want us experiencing and walking in joy. He's actually actively trying to steal your joy. And when I started recognizing that on a daily basis, it made me kind of mad. And it made me mad because I thought about all the times I'd let him win. Thought about all the days that I'd let him win, all of the weeks that I had let him win and steal my joy. This has to stop because one of the markers of being a Christ follower is joy. It is in fact joy. And it's not because our lives are so perfect and everything's going well and everyone's getting along. But Christians know how to take a lot of hardship and come out the other side because it was God that gave them strength. And that has to be our perspective. I can take on hardship because it's God that's giving me the strength and providing the strength for me in this situation. And listen, when the Apostle Paul was going through a hardship, which was probably about 95% of his life, he would speak out his gratitude. And we see this in the letters that he wrote to other believers. He starts his writings out with, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the, from the time you first heard it, until now. We're talking about a man who has endured beatings, imprisonment, starvation, rejection, shipwrecks, venomous snake bites. Like how random is that? This man has been through all of that. And he understood that the secret of cultivating joy was gratitude. Even when his emotion didn't feel happy he could still cultivate joy. Gratitude cultivates joy. That's number one. Number two, embrace hardship. Romans 5, three through five says, and not only this, but with joy, let us exalt in our sufferings and rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship, distress, pressure, trouble, produces patient endurance, and endurance, proven character, spiritual maturity, and proven character, hope, and confidence, confident assurance of eternal salvation. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Joy isn't found in the circumstance. That's what Paul's saying here. If you're looking to your circumstance to find joy, you're not gonna find it. It's found in embracing your purpose through that circumstance. And you know, while, while Paul was writing many of his letters, he wasn't sitting on a beach drinking a pina colada. You know, he wasn't waiting until everyone was getting along and everyone's happy and everything's going well and my bank account is full. And life is so wonderful. He wrote about joy after he was horribly beaten and sitting in prison. And in this verse, Paul is declaring, rather than focusing on what God is doing to me, I am deciding to focus on what God is doing through me, through my situation, because it was Paul's chains that brought him influence. It was his chains. He says to, in his letter to the Philippians, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. 
As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel with out fear. It was Paul's chains that propelled the gospel forward. It was his chains that gave Christians the, the, the boldness and the wisdom to speak out and speak to other people. It was his chains that broke the back of fear. And it was his chains that taught him he could be content in every situation, regardless of the circumstance. And you have to hear today that God will not waste your circumstance. We don't serve a wasteful God. He will not waste your circumstances, the things that you are walking through, the things that you have been through. He will use it for his glory. And you know, maybe we need to change our perspective on going through difficult times. You know, so often we pray that, God, please take this hardship from me. Make this go away. Make this hardship cease. And that's how I pray. (laughs) I get it. We pray that the hardship goes away. But the way that Paul prayed is that he would endure with joy through the hardship. And I don't think I've ever had anyone ask me to pray for them in that way. Oh, Pastor Crystal, please pray that I endure with joy through this hardship. It's a different way of looking, right? It's that slight change in perspective. And it makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, with parents, I hear this so often. I hear parents say, I just want my kids to be happy. And, again, there is nothing wrong with happiness. We all want to be I want to be happy. <laughs> we all want to be happy. But I think we may need to reevaluate the way that we talk about happiness and the way that we, we talk about happiness with our children. Because so often in our society, we're putting happiness on this pedestal. Do what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy. So we've put it on this pedestal and we may be doing our kids a disservice by speaking about it in that way because we've now become a society that values happiness over inner strength. Inner strength. We've become a society that values happiness over obedience to Christ, which doesn't always feel great. When I was in um, Africa working with International Justice Mission, um, I met an American family there. So this is, um, this is Matt and, and Joy Robbins. And Matt was working with International Justice Mission um, as a fellow, so, which basically means he was getting support. He wasn't being paid directly by International Justice Mission. He was raising all of his own support, and he was working with our office in Ghana. He was working under the Ghanaians, and they were working with the police, you know, being able to get rescues, uh, rescue all of these children who've been enslaved on Lake Volta and working with churches, getting the churches involved. So when I met Matt, I believe he was towards the end of his his first year there with his family. And you can see his kids are quite young. Um, And interestingly enough, his wife's name is Joy, so it fits well today. But um, they were, I believe, going into their second year of living in Africa. And one day his his daughter Hannah, his oldest daughter here, she's, she's quite young, She went to him in tears, and she said, Daddy, everything was better before we moved to Ghana. Why did you have to move us to Ghana? And so Matt answered her, and he said, to rescue children from slavery. And she said, why couldn't someone else do it? And the words from this little nine-year-old were so poignant to me because How many times have I said that to God? When I'm going through a hardship, when I'm going through something that's really, really tough, I always get to a point where I go, why can't someone else do this? I maybe don't want to do this anymore. And so I wanted to read to you Matt's response to his daughter when he journaled about it, he said, this is an interaction that would have deeply troubled me a few years ago. 
I would have grieved my child's unhappiness and questioned my own sense of calling in the work I do. I would have felt that I was wronging my child by seeking to help other children. These precious young tears would have ripped me apart. But last night, they didn't bother me a bit. I could hold her and give her comfort and love and compassion without any inkling of doubt, despair, or regret. And how is that? The truth is that my daughter is thriving in a hundred ways, even in her temporary unhappiness. I want my children to be happy, but that is not my deepest yearning for them. I want them to be brave, so I let them experience fear. I want them to be compassionate, so I let them see suffering. I want them to be strong, so I let them struggle with appropriate burdens. And I want them to be grounded, so I accept that they will have moments of disorientation in their life. I want them to be creative, so I let them be bored. Building these qualities into them requires hardship and discomfort, which feels in the moment like unhappiness. So be it. Her tears do not disturb me like they used to because my goal is not to give her a tear-free childhood. My goal is to help her grow into a magnificent, wonderful, incredible woman of strength, courage, compassion, faith, and creativity who can stand fast in the storms of life. These tears don't threaten that goal. They are a path to the goal's achievement. So I held her tight and I rocked her and I listened long and carefully to her struggles and I answered her questions gently and tenderly but with unwavering conviction in our mission and full assurance that neither she nor I are the center of the universe. Also, I simply do not believe that a life of self-focus, ease and comfort will ultimately make either of us happy in the long run. I read a quote this morning from Tim Keller It says, I can think of nothing great that is also easy. And daughter, you will be great. Matt is cultivating lasting, deep-rooted joy within his children. And embracing hardship with hope, that is how we cultivate joy. Number three, relationship. And this is really a two-parter. Relationship is referring to both time with God and time with Christ followers. Our time with God, this is what gives us hope. It helps us see beyond our current situation to the future miracle. It shifts our perspective. Time with God gives us the opportunity to receive his forgiveness, to to feel his forgiveness, and to truly experience the release of shame from our life. We only get these things from spending it with God, from going to God. Joy comes from the presence of the Lord. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. There is a refilling of joy that you are only going to get by connecting to the presence of God. That is the only place that it is going to happen because he is the source of joy. We have, so Peter and I have two teenagers. There are two teenagers in our house. We also have a consistent lack of phone chargers in our house. And there is a universal law that says you can have electronic charging devices or you can have teenagers, but you cannot have both. I see um, some of you are uh, familiar with this law, but chargers consistently go missing in our home. And I can, I can buy a pack on Amazon and I turn my head the next day they're gone. They're just gone and, and no one ever knows what happens to them. And so one day I'm, I'm, I've got my phone and, and you know, I'm, I'm watching the battery die because I cannot find my phone charger. And I'm, you know, I'm looking all around, no one knows where it is. So I'm, I'm just watching, I'm thinking of all the stuff I gotta do, all the phone calls I need to return, all the emails and my battery is slowly dying. And 
I had this really strange thought like, I know where the electricity exists. I know where it is. It's right here. And I can even put my phone against the wall and nothing's going to, it's right here. It's right here. This is so frustrating. I can see it. This is the source. This is what I need. But the problem is, unless I can connect to this source, nothing's happening, right? Like, I can know where the electricity and the energy is. I can know all about it. I can even understand how it works. But until I take my connector and plug in to this area, I do not have access. I don't have access. And so I sit here and I watch my phone battery die because I am not able to connect. I'm not able to plug in to the source of power. We must, you can know that God is your source. You can know everything about God. You can know all the scriptures. Unless you connect to that source, your joy battery is gonna keep getting lower and lower and lower until you've reconnected with that source of energy. And how do we do that? That's through prayer, that's through time in the word, listening to sermons, worship. These are all ways that we can connect with our source of joy, with our source of, of energy, of power. And secondly, time with God's people. It is important to gather with other believers. It's important to gather with other people who are full of joy and full of faith. Joy is magnetic. People want to spend time with, with, with joy-filled people. It's, it's something that, that, that draws people to you when you have joy in your life. Joy is fuel for your soul. And listen, I'm not saying find the bubbliest person in the room, they've got the joy, and go spend time with them. Joy isn't a personality. You can actually have a very laid back personality and have joy that exists within you because joy comes from the Holy Spirit, not our personality. Does that make sense? So how can you determine if you are operating in joy, if joy exists in your life? Well, that's by the words that come out of your mouth. I know sometimes we come from families and there was a lot of negativity within this family. And maybe we had a mom or a dad that was just always speaking negatively. We have to cut off the curse of negativity. We have to cut that off from our life. So if your inner dialogue is going straight to your parents' voice of negativity, if that's really your default, this internal dialogue of negativity, listen, girl, you're going to have to take that internal dialogue, run it through the word of God, and make sure that's what comes out of your mouth, not the negativity. Because there, there's some, there are some serious issues when we are only speaking negative words, when we only see the downside. We have to break off negativity. And why? Because the joy of the Lord is our If your strength is depleting, you've got to refill on your joy. If you feel like, I cannot get through this day, everything is going wrong, you need a refilling of joy. Will you stand with me right now? I understand there are going to be situations and there are going to be days and there are going to be weeks that are just tough. And they're tough not necessarily because you've done something wrong, but because we live in a fallen world. And we work with people and people are messy, right? We're not perfect. But we cannot afford to lose our joy. And joy comes from God. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. So will you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, 
I thank you for today. I thank you that we had the opportunity to come here and gather together as people who love you. I thank you that we are not in danger for gathering. I thank you that we're safe. Father God, I pray for our brothers and sisters who are unable to gather together. I pray for our brothers and sisters who are in places in the world where it's dangerous, where their lives are being threatened for for gathering, God. And we just pray a special protection over them. Father, give them joy as they walk through these circumstances. Give them joy. Give them peace that passes all understanding. Father God, this week, May we not allow the enemy to steal our joy. As as we are hit with situations in life, God, we ask that you fill us up when we connect with you, God. Just an infilling of joy in the mighty name of Jesus. 